Okay, okay, okay. So we are going to talk about how to grow a business. Because there's a lot of information out there about how to start a business. Lots of information. And you know, I can help you find that online during the break. But how do you grow a company? Because all the issues that we've been talking about today, about whether we feel entitled to make money, whatever the myths and, 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 and taboos may be in your family about you know, what it means to be rich. You know, when I first thought of this program, this Make Money Million Dollar Business Program, a lot of women came up to me who knew me and very quietly said, no, it's a really good idea, but that's not for me. I would look at her and say, why not? And said, well, I'm not ready to be a millionaire. <laughs> I'm not ready to be a millionaire. I would have to explain to them that if you had a million dollar business, that's a million dollars in gross revenue, you would not be a millionaire. Don't worry. Try it. <laughs> and, and some of them would go, oh, okay. So, so, so whatever it takes for you to, 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 to think about this, it's, um, it's important that you, um, I think, get comfortable. Because making money, making money is about us being able to do what we want to do for ourselves and our families. All the things we talk about in terms of what we want for our families, what we want for ourselves, what we want for our parents, our children, grandparents, whatever it is, it often requires that we've got some money. And rather than waiting for there to be some middle man to provide that money, we can do that ourselves and are doing it ourselves. The question is how do we do it in, in, in greater numbers, both in terms of the number of women who have businesses, but also in terms of the amount of money that we make. Because I became committed to helping women get to a million. There were two moments for me. One was reading the US Census. I read the US Census one day. I had started Count Me, and Count Me was one of my dreams to have an organization that helps women be whoever they want to be and, 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 and grow a business, make money, create jobs for other people, bring wonderful products to market. But after I had started it, and, and it was going along okay, I learned from the US Census that out of 10 and a half million women who have a business in the United States, only 250,000 are at a million dollars or more in revenue. 10 million, only a quarter million at a million. There are a million men in the US at a million. So I said, how can this be? How can this be? Because I'm not one of these gals who walks around and says, you know, that we're smarter than men, because I, I don't know. But I know we are as smart, and I know we're smarter about some things. So why is it that we don't? Because what I have seen in the 10, 12 years I've been doing this is the products and services that women come up with are not only incredible, but so needed. Because in some cases, you know, if a woman hasn't been in the room where they're inventing these things, some of those products don't necessarily work so well for us. Or for our kids. Or for our men, for that matter. So we have an opportunity. There's this huge segment of the population that is yet to unleash their creativity and bring all these incredible products to market. So I had an experience. So, so I read the census, and then this incredible woman walks into our organization and into my life. Her name is Beatrice Ramos. Beatrice, for, stand up so people can see you. She's a beautiful girl. There's Beatrice. And there's Beatrice with then Senator, Senator Hillary Rodham Clinton. But I meet Beatrice, and Beatrice, unlike a lot of the women that have been coming to count me in, she has a slightly bigger business. She's already at about $200,000 in revenue. Beatrice, at that time, had an animation company. She now makes commercials. She's a brilliant artist. And she needed bigger loans than we made. We only made $5,000 loans. And just looking at the progress that she was making, I remember us all sitting around trying to figure out how we could help her. We just decided, let's just give her a bigger loan. So we did. And it was through the process of working with her that we came up with this program called Make Money Million Dollar Business. So this picture of, of Beatrice with, 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 with Senator Clinton, uh, Secretary Clinton, was who else was into this? Because here's one of the first lessons about growing a business. You have to tell people what you want and need. Beatrice said, I need help. She was doing OK, but she needed more help. She couldn't afford to buy any more computers to do her animation. She'd spent all her money. So we helped her do that. I knew 
knew I needed help to launch this movement, I went to someone that I knew, said my senator, she was our senator in New York at the time, to say, would you like to help us launch this effort? And she immediately said yes. So one of the important lessons about growing a business is mobilizing who you know. Growing a business is not a solitary activity. One human being can only make so much money. So, so you need to mobilize the people that you know. The next thing you need to do is to rely on your buddies and your friends because Beatrice came to meet us uh, through her friend Mirabelle, who had both come. Mirabelle, so let me tell you just a little bit about leave, leave Mirabelle up there. Beatrice and Mirabelle were friends. They'd come to New York from, from Venezuela together. And Mirabelle heard about what Count Me In was doing and told Beatrice. Beatrice got involved with this, and eventually Mirabelle did too. Beatrice is a million dollar business now. She has offices in New York. And is opening a branch of her company in Caracas. So she is providing jobs. She has about 12 full-time employees. She works with 10 to 30 freelancers. She provides that many jobs for people in New York, Caracas, wherever she works. And Mirabelle now has, when we met her, she had a restaurant that you could fit on this stage. <laughs> It was beautiful, filled, it was smaller, it was smaller, it really was. It was made, it had a great takeout business, wonderful, um, I, I, I'm going to say it wrong, arepas, arepas, arepas. Yes, have you been there? Uh, yes, okay, excellent, excellent food. Very, very good food, but it was tiny. And as she worked with us, she now has three restaurants. And she's at well over a million dollars every year for the past like three or four years, and had a baby, did all kinds of things. So, so it's important to work with a buddy as you're growing your company. Doesn't necessarily mean you need a partner in your company, but you need somebody else. I and mean, it's why people come to count me in, and why I'm so thrilled that Coca-Cola said that they wanted to do work with 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 with, with count me in, and, and that Nelly brought us into this, because we need each other to, to, to grow our companies. We learn a lot from each other. I'm standing here, Sandra, wherever you are. I'm using the same timepiece you did. I never thought to do this. I always stand and speak, and I'm worried about whether I'm taking up too much time, and I can just look out of the clock. Woo! What an innovation. <laughs> but we learn from each other all the time, right? So, so, so Mirabelle has this incredible restaurant, great business, and um, has, has just done so many of the things she wants, growing her family and growing her company. The next person I met who has an incredible story, Cynthia Rubio. Cynthia is in Austin, Texas. Because I think one of the other things that keeps us wondering whether we can grow our company is can I grow my company and take care of my family? Most, what we've learned talking to a lot of women, we've been doing this for 10 years, is that a lot of women see their life sort of like a table, like about this big. And the family's on the table, and the business is on the table, and it's kind of like if I can see it all and get my arms around it, that I can handle it. Which means that you keep the company really small. And Cynthia was in a very interesting position. She has four children. She just had her fourth baby. And her husband, to support the family, had to take a job where he was on an airplane from Monday to Friday. So he was not home. So you know how that goes. That's not good. It's not good for the kids. It's not good for the marriage. It's not good for anything. And Cynthia and her husband talked about it. And Cynthia had gone to college. She came here from Mexico. She'd gone to college. She had an engineering degree. And she said, I'm going to come up with a company that within the next three to four years, you won't have to travel anymore. We can work together and we can, you know, manage the family better or whatever. She comes to count me in. She had come up with the most extraordinary technology. Because one of the brilliant things that women do is solve problems with their businesses. They not only solve problems with their family, but they solve problems for the world. This was very soon after uh, Katrina. And I think we all remember when people who were moved from hospitals and nursing homes got separated from their, their families and their loved ones. Nobody knew where they got moved. They couldn't find them for weeks. She came up with a bracelet using radio frequency technology that allows hospitals and nursing homes in disasters to put those bracelets on their patients. And when they are moved, if they have to be moved, everybody can find them. So Cynthia comes up with this incredible technology. She now has a $4 million business. Her husband 
didn't have to wait three years. He only had to do that awful, you know, five days he would have an airplane for six months. Came home, went to work for her. <laughs> happily, happily went to work for her because he had a different set of skills. He's a great marketer, but he's not a CEO type, so, so it worked out for the family. But now they have this beautiful situation where they have this growing company. She sold, um, she sells a lot of her products to, to the state of Texas, to states where they border on places where there are hurricanes and, and natural disasters. And unfortunately, it looks like she's going to be having more and more business given what's going on with our weather. But she came up with something so wonderful and simple, and who wouldn't want to know where their loved ones are? And she, she came up with a way of, of doing that. So, so here's another example. If you, are, if you are thinking about starting a business, think about solving a problem. Think about how you have solved a problem. Because I, 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 I know women who have solved problems mean simple problems. Anybody who's had a two-year-old knows at some point they run around the house with the toilet paper, you know, putting it everywhere, yeah. and, then, and then balling up and putting it in the toilet. And you have to call the plumber. And a woman that I know came up with something called the toilet paper saver, which is a clip that you put on the toilet paper roll. Adults can get it off, but two-year-olds can't. And she's made a fortune coming up with products that solve those kinds of everyday problems. So when you're thinking about this, or when you're thinking about, you know, if you have a business and you're expanding your product line, because what sells today? Because I've been doing a lot of interviews, you know, in between, in between these wonderful talks and times with you today. And people are so stuck on the bad news about the economy that they think there's no way to start a business or grow a business in this economy. And Cynthia's business is growing. Mirabelle's business is growing. Beatrice, you're growing. Yes? Yes, yes, yes. There are lots of companies. As much as there is unemployment and challenge, people continue to spend money and need things. Governments need things. Um, you know, uh, big companies need things. Beatrice, I think you've, you've made some uh, commercials with Ogilvy for Coke. So I, I think there are lots of opportunities. Because the way to think about getting bigger, the way to think about growing your company and where you can support other people and, and create jobs for others. Because how many, how many of us have experienced unemployment in our families or ourselves in this? Yeah, so yeah, put, it, put them up, put them up. Because it's been tough. It's been tough. And I think it really makes us think about how to create things that will make our families more secure. Because everybody thinks about businesses as being risky. Yes, they are. But they also create great opportunities for us to grow as people and for us to help other people. Before I get to my next stories, I think there's some other things that are really important that I want you to write down. I, I think the, the biggest challenge that women have growing their companies is thinking that they have to do everything themselves. How many of you, how many, how many of you feel overwhelmed? Oh yeah, two hands, yes, yes. If I had a dollar for every time I said to somebody, oh, by the time I explained it to you, I could have done it myself. <laughs> how many of you said that? Yes, 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 right? Raise your hands. Okay, okay. It took me like three or four years to realize that if I took the time to explain it to someone so that they understood it, I would never have to do it again. How about that? So this notion that it won't be right if we don't do it, and I think some of the students in our homes also, and then we wonder why people don't help us at home. <laughs> so it's very important to, to, to really learn. And if you buddy up with somebody from, from this conference or you, you have friends, you all got to check each other on how many things you're doing that someone else could do with you, for you, that you could, you could get someone else to do. That Because you, and Sandra talked about the 10 ways that you are different. Think about the 10 ways that you're different. I think it's a very cool way to think about the 10 ways that your product or your service is different, what differentiates you from other people. But there's another list that you need to keep for yourself. When you do your to-do list every day, or every week, or however you do it, look at it very closely. And really think about what is on that that only you can do. As opposed to being frantic about, how am I going to get all this done? 
what are on there that only you can do, and then who else can I get to help me with these other things? Or who else can I turn these over to? And sometimes that's an employee, sometimes that's a somebody that you're going to come in to help you work up with on a project, sometimes it's a family member, it can be any number, it can be a virtual assistant, you know, that you hire for, you know, a couple hours a day, whatever it is, but start to think about how you expand your capacity for growth. Because that is one of the key things we've seen over and over and over again. The first year we did this program, we analyzed the women who got to a million, and the one thing they had in common, all different kinds of businesses, all different kinds, all different parts of the country, different ethnic groups, ages, everything. The thing, the one thing they had in common was that they all used a grocery delivery service. And I remember we all first looked at thing, wow, what it said was that they valued their time and felt that if they could not spend the two hours or the three hours or the hour, however long as it takes you to do your grocery shopping, if that could be a phone call as opposed to a big trip to the store and the car and all that stuff, and in New York, the taxi, the stroller, whatever, that that saved them time. So this issue of time being your most precious thing is true in your life and it is true in business. Figure out what you're best at, what makes you different, what you need to spend your time doing, and move the other stuff off to somebody else. Because getting someone to help you, getting someone to help you, is, is not an admission of failure or that you can't do something. It's, an, it, 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 it's a realization that you need, you need more people around you to make this bigger and better. It's not a bad thing, it's a good thing. I think the other thing that holds us back here is, is being afraid that somebody's going to take our business from us. Who, who's, who's, yeah, I heard a lot of them. Yeah. <laughs> You're the CEO. You're the boss. You thought of this. And I think the other thing you've got to start thinking about yourself is that you're the boss. It's your company. <coughs> so I know one of the challenges that Beatrice often talked about was she, she went back and forth between being the artist that she is and sort of resisting being, you know, the boss of the company, the CEO of the company, and making some of those tough decisions. But once she, she's still an artist, she added something to her resume. It's not, it's not like we can only be one thing. We can be an artist and a CEO. So really think about, as, as you want to grow, because there's so many examples of, of, of decisions you can make. I mean, one, of the, one of the most obvious things that I've seen a number of times because of the popularity of cupcake companies, companies and businesses, you know, there's some women I meet across the country who the biggest aspiration is the bakery. And that's a good business. She's going to make $200,000, $250,000 in revenue if she really gets it done. The ones that are making millions are the ones that figure out how to sell it, at, at, at sell whatever they're baking at Walmart or, or you know, Whole Foods or, or, or to, to Starbucks or something like that and figure out that if people like my product, maybe there's a way where I can sell it to a larger number of people. So it's figuring out how to expand. And one of the important things about coming to events like this is you get to meet people who have made some of those steps you, or, or you create a franchise and then there are many of the things that you created. And you're still the boss, it's still yours. It's still yours, but now many more people can benefit from the brilliant idea that you have. So the, the next slide is of my dear friend, Teresa Dayton. When Teresa came to count me in, she was at $100,000 in revenue and had one or two employees, and she's the mother of six. Her youngest children were twins, and they were two years old. Just two months ago, she was in Ink Magazine. She, um, Ink Magazine does a, a, an Ink 500 like they do the Fortune 500. She was number 269 on the Ink 500 list. She went from $100,000 in revenue to $17 million. And Teresa, one of the critical decisions she made when she first won our competition, she decided the most important thing she had to do was hire someone to help her with the twins. 
<laughs> she hired the person to help her with the twins, freed up her husband more. Her husband had some experience in, she's in the construction field, had some understanding. He knew the construction business. He is not a CEO type either. He went to work for her. Within a year, they were at three million in revenue because she just eased up the pressure on herself enough. Now, I'll never forget one day, a couple years ago in the summer, I was calling her because she, she's been very generous. She comes to speak. She really wanted to come here today and, and, and was not able to because it was the, it's the twins' birthday or something. But she, um, I called her one day in the summer and I got no reply and it was very unusual. And so I called her for like three days in a row and finally I reached her in the office very early in the morning. And she said, Nell, I'm on, on, I'm on my summer schedule. And I said, well, you know, how's that working? What is that? And she said, well, I come into the office at 5, I bring my breakfast with me, I get a lot of you know, work done, and I leave at 2, and I take all the kids, all six kids, to the pool. I'm doing that for a month this summer because the kids were really upset about not having enough time with mommy. So she, at that, at that point, had enough employees that she could come and do her work, leave, the company ran fine, and she got to spend time with her children. And I think all of these strategies, she has now spoken at the White House. I mean, she, she has gone, um, she, she does uh, construction management projects for huge um, uh, buildings, uh, both at universities, government buildings, all kinds of things. She really learned government contracts. I think that's a whole other set of opportunities. Billions of dollars, billions of dollars that is available for us to get involved in, in government contracting. I'm sure the people in this room have gotten some government contracts. There are growing opportunities. The government has to give 5% of all contracts to women-owned businesses. They have to. And there is not a department in the government, I think, with the exception of our HUD, that has done it yet. So there's lots of opportunity. There's lots for us to learn about it, but there's also lots of opportunity. Teresa is extremely encouraging because we see her getting a business of 17 million, and I would say much of that is, is through government contracting work. So there are opportunities. There are other Latinas in County Inn who have construction companies in Florida and other parts of the country who are also doing the work this way. Uh, so there are you know many ways. Thinking, think about. Uh, big box stores, HSN, QVC, all those places, all of those places present opportunities for women to grow their companies. And part of what we do at Count Me In is help you figure out, you know, how how to how to broker those opportunities and how to how to think about your products in a way where you can sell them, you know, to, to, to that many people. Because that's what really, if if you have big aspirations for a company, that's where there's a lot of money to be. Now, the, the, the next picture is, is an extraordinary time that I had and we all had this summer. We got invited to ring the bell at the New York Stock Exchange. Yes. And they hadn't had that many women in that place for quite a while. And it was an extraordinary moment for all of us. I, Teresa, is, you can see Teresa in the corner with the, with the sort of uh, tangerine colored jacket. Right? That, that, that's Teresa. And as we walked into this very grand place, I had never been in the stock exchange. I, I grew up in, in, in politics. Um, and uh, the, 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 the stock, stock exchange was not, it was, it was democratic liberal politics. It was not, it's not a place that you went or thought about very much. Um, and so I had never been there, and most of the women there had not been there before. And it's this huge, you know, 19th century building with very high ceilings and a, and a conference table that seats 45. So we walked in this place and they had lovely tea and coffee and whatever. And and Teresa came over to me and she said, if my grandfather could see me, her grandfather had come to the United States from Chile, and he had always watched the stock market. He never had enough money to put in it, but he always paid attention to it. And she was just crying, thinking about what it would mean to him to know that she was in there. And many of the women there had those kinds of experiences, but the realization that we all had together was how much money that already represented. 
because there are some women in that group who are now at 30 million. And we counted it up, and it was about 200 million in revenue already. But the next question we started to ask ourselves was which one of our companies, and I am now including all of you in this question, which one of us is going to be traded on the stock exchange? Yeah. yeah. How are we going to grow our companies? And I have no doubt that we can. Well, people will be trading our stocks. So I think the, the, the issues here is us thinking big enough. You know, Simon talked about finding your voice. When you find your voice, you then need to give voice to the vision that you have for what you see in your life. And if business is, is something that you want to do and grow, how, what does that look like? You really need to let your imagination go in terms of how many people you see buying your product or where you see it. So that other people can help you with that. If, 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 because often what happens in situations, you know, when I meet women, they're, they're, I met a woman today, where was she? Who wanted to take my picture, and she said she was trying to be the Latina Martha Stewart. Right here. Right here. <laughs> we are not trying, we are. You are. Yes, yes. Speak in this very affirmative language. Very affirmative language. This is not to suggest that there are not many challenges along the way. Because my recipe for success is think, start out thinking with the end in mind. What, what in your wildest dreams do you want to have happen? What is that? My wildest dream is a million women and a million. That's a trillion dollars and four million new jobs. That's my dream. Okay? So there's room for everybody in this room to fit into that dream. But for that to happen, you also have to have a big dream, yeah? Yeah. So 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 really start to think about it and let your imagination run wild. All of this 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 day was constructed to help you get to what I'm talking about now. Whether it is your own business or in a company that you work in or something you want to do with your family, these lessons apply. So use your imagination. The third thing is expect resistance. Expect people to say to you, you know, who do you think you are? You know, who says that you can do that? Or, you know, and it could be a parent, a spouse, a, you know, a girlfriend, somebody. That's when you also start to know who the people are who really get you. When they say that you can't do this, well, uh, you know. But listen, listen to it, not to take any criticism. But listen to it because often people who are who are naysayers do see something that you might need to tweak in what you're doing. So listen. Try and not get defensive. I know it's very hard, but don't get defensive. Listen to what they say and you say, thanks, I'll consider that. Because sometimes they're giving you some really valuable information. So that's how I think it's important to look at criticism. When I when I designed Take Our Daughters to Work Day, like almost 20 years ago. The first time I presented it in the boardroom was at the Miss Foundation for Women with Gloria Steinem and all these other really wonderful women. But there was a woman on the board who obviously didn't like the idea. <laughs> and, but I didn't know it at the time. I knew it in a few minutes because she looked at me and she said, she said, well, I guess that means the daughters of prostitutes will have to go to work with their mothers. Wow. <laughs> yeah, that was my reaction. She was like, wow. <laughs> but I came back very quickly and I said, you know, I said, I unfortunately think the daughters of prostitutes know exactly what they want to And what they need is opportunities to see other things. And don't you know, from what Nellie was talking about, three days later, a letter comes in from a homeless shelter, from a group of mothers who said, please, could someone at the Miss Foundation arrange for our daughters to go to work 
so that they could see something different than what's happened to us. So I, I think there is always, so, so when people are pushing your buttons, push back, push back, but also take it in because she obviously, she, this, this lady had some issues. <laughs> um, and, and, and the answer came though, the answer came from the very mother she was talking about, whether these women were homeless, prostitutes, whatever they were, they were not in the best position to help their daughters at the moment. And they had the good sense to reach out and say, hey, could you, could you show? Could you show our daughters what, 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 you know, what your workplace is like or something like that? So, 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 so expect this, this resistance. You know, expect it you know, and use it. Use it, use it, use it. You know what big companies, well, you, some of you may work in big companies, they do a SWOT analysis of your strengths, weaknesses, opportunities. All, you know, if somebody starts to do that, so to turn it into that. Turn it into that. If somebody's really, you know, well, what, what do you think would work about this? You know, or, but, but, but don't get too hung up on it. Use the information. The next thing is very, very, this goes back to what I said before. I talk about this all the time. You have got to mobilize people to help you. When you're ready, everybody's got to know. I know Michelle's been talking about um, uh, personal branding and all that stuff. You have got to be ready with your branding, your marketing, but you got to let the community that you have know and their communities know whatever it is you're launching or starting and, and how you want them involved. You've got to invite people. The number of women who start a business and wait for customers. The number of people, I don't think this is just women. I think this is men and women who start a business and are just waiting for the customers to come. You've got to go find customers. You've got you to work that and make sure they know where you are and what you have and what makes you different. What makes you different? That list of those 10 things about what makes you different, you gotta do one for your company. What makes your company different so that people wanna to come to you versus your competitor? The next thing that is very important that it fits with what we're doing with the altar, it fits with all the things, you've got to write these things down. The more you start to consolidate this and put it on a piece of paper, it doesn't have to, I am not a big fan of 30 page business plans or anything like that. There are books out that tell you how to write a one page business plan, I would do that. <laughs> I really would. Start with a one pager because as you're growing and figuring out, you can change it every week if you want. Change it in a 30 page business plan. You just throw your hands up and say, oh, I don't want to, I can't, I don't have the time, I don't want to do it. One page. One page. Write it down and make sure you show it to people. One of the things we ask at Count Me In, you know, is, is do you have a business plan? Because you don't have to have one. But do you have one? The next question we ask is, has anybody read it? <laughs> but you got it. You got to start to show it to other people because think about what you're doing. You're actually, you want to step out there and sell things. So you gotta, you gotta show people what it is that you're thinking about and what you're doing. Because people, most people, I talked about the resistance, most people want to help you. Most people want you to be successful. Because the more of us that are successful, the more of us will be successful. Right. Think about it. That is one of the most important things in this room. Whatever we want to be successful at, the more we do it together, it creates like a tornado of activity. Where there are more goods and services going back and forth, where there's more opportunity around, there are more jobs around. You know, the next time you hear, you know, somebody's husband, brother, father needs a job, one of us can probably hire them. This notion of waiting, we wait for things to be perfect. How many of us wait for things to be perfect? Right, right? Wait for things to be perfect. Wait for things to be perfect. Wait till we lose that last 10 pounds. Right? <laughs> I'm going to do this when I lose that last 10 pounds. I'm telling you that's not happening. It's not happening. <laughs> and you can still do all this stuff. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. It'd be nice, but you know, whatever. So, 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 so think about the, that, the, this notion of being present in the here and now. What are you going to do right now? What are you going to do right now today to sort of move whatever your idea is, whatever you desire? How are you going to move that forward? And often it is speaking it and writing it down. Because the sooner you do that, think about it. 
The sooner you do it, the sooner you can show it to somebody else and somebody else can help you. Because the biggest myth out there is that you have to do this all yourself. You have to be the accountant, you have to be the, 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 uh, the, the distributor, the marketer, the designer, the whatever. You don't have to be everything. No one is everything. Through the teaching and training that we've been doing at Count Me In, lots of micro enterprise programs have realized that they're training people to stay small. Because they tell you that you have to learn how to do everything, and you kind of can't do that. It's very hard to be able to do everything. So figure out how you're different. I love that. that. Figure out how you're different. Figure out what is the most valuable thing for you to be doing with your time. What is the most important thing for you to do with your time to grow your company? Often, if you're the founder of the company, it is selling. It is selling or creating the next iteration of the product or something like that or expanding strategic partnerships. That is often what it is, but sometimes it's something totally different. And figure out how to surround yourself with people that you find who are best at what they do and what you do. What we're going to be doing next in the program, and I, I'm not going to talk about it much, but it's learning how to speak about this in a way that, because if you can't talk about your company in a succinct way, it's hard for people to help you, but it's really hard for you to hire anybody. Because if you can't describe what's going on, how, how do you know that they know how to do it, that they want to do it, and all that kind of stuff? How do you get investors if you want investors? How do you how do you expand the concept <clears throat> if you haven't gotten a clear, crystallized way of expressing what it is about? Because a lot of us think our products speak for themselves. And every once in a while, that's true. But most of the time, there's got to be a little talking or a little writing that goes with the thing so that people understand how it's going to benefit them. So we need to learn how to do all of that. And think about partners. Think about who you can work with. I hope you meet someone here today that you can work with or can you know, maybe be helpful to you. In, in, in We work with lots of partners. I mean, Coke, we are so happy. I saw, I was at the Clinton Global Initiative last two summers ago, two, two Septembers ago, when Coke announced that they wanted to get, they are planning, they are not wanting, they are going to get five million women into business uh, by 2020. I remember reading that and just cheering because up until that point, I hadn't seen anyone else talk about putting a million dollars, a million people, a million women in the same sentence with business. Because we've been talking about getting a million women to a million, and here's Coke talking about getting five million women into business in 10 years, and I was so encouraged. <laughs> And I'm so happy to be here. But we work with partners all over the country. We're going to be doing some work. Uh, we've done work with Walmart and Samsung. We're going to be doing some work with them in Los Angeles in the first quarter of next year. So you'll be seeing that on our website. And we will keep you informed of all the different opportunities that there are to work with us around the country and, and in Los Angeles and online. There's lots and lots of opportunity. You have to step forward and take it. Tell people what you need. Because what I am convinced of, what I have seen, I have seen too many women get to a million dollars since the recession to not know, to, 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 to be sure that it is possible. It is possible, it is doable, it is a decision that you need to make. And then you need to reach out to get all the help that you need to do it. But to get the best help, you have to be able to inform the people that are helping you. That's why the writing it down is so important. So we can look at something, or you're going to see in a few minutes, so you can speak in like two minutes and tell people what it is that you do and what, it, what would be helpful to you. So somebody can very quickly say, oh, that, you know, it's great. So I want to thank all of you for coming today. I think this has been an extraordinary journey, and there's still more to come today. But an extraordinary group of women who are already successful, who could be that much more successful. It's just, just decide. Just decide that that's where you want to be. And all of us will be here with you.
Thank you very much.